Jeez. And um, this is a lecture for my first hour class on 427. Okay, so you, there's no need for you to ever miss class. And again, just as a reminder, we're getting down to the last, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. We're getting down to the last couple of days since uh, this week we um, had a, uh, you know, we're going to have a rupture in proceedings. Uh, I've extended the time to make up the makeup test. If you miss, then you can take that actually instead of today was going to be the deadline, but you can take it tomorrow if that applies. I think most people in here have already taken it and gone on their way, which is a good plan. Um, and the other thing is, if you ever miss, you know, if you miss Friday, we're going to take a test. And if you miss next Thursday, don't come on Friday and say, well, I wasn't here yesterday. Do I have to take the test? The answer is yes, you do. So you can watch this uh, on YouTube, so be sure that you do that. Well, anyway, when we left off the other day, we were talking about the rise. One of the major events that happens in the 1920s is the rise of the Prohibition Movement. And it didn't happen overnight. It started out with temperance before the Civil War, the temperance movement didn't want to <laughs> do away with alcohol. The temperance movement simply wanted people to moderate their drinking. You know, if you watch the Super Bowl, and I don't, I don't like professional football, but once in a while I'll glance in, they say people watch it for the commercials, and they'll have a commercial, and likely is not, correct me if I'm wrong, but there'll be a bunch of guys in a bar drinking a beer, you know, and having a high old time watching the Super Bowl. And that ad is put out by Anheuser-Busch, the biggest beer producer in the world, and you're sitting about five hours away from that up in St. Louis, Missouri. But at the end of the commercial, I have at the bottom, drink responsibly. In other words, okay, if you choose to drink, drink, but drink responsibly. Don't drink four cases of beer and then tell all your friends, oh, I can make it home just fine. Kill yourself and three other people. Drink responsibly. If you're going to drink, if you think you're going to get a drink until you just, you know, you're really not yourself, you know, incapable of driving always. If you're a group of people, take one guy who doesn't drink, you know, he'll drink club soda at the bar while you all are getting plastered, and then he'll take you all home at least you'll all arrive alive and you won't kill anybody on the way. <coughs> well, that's what the temperance movement was. It is a stop drinking. It's a matter of choice. If you want to drink, go ahead, but moderate your drinking. Again, drink a couple of wine, a glasses of wine after dinner. Don't drink a couple of liters. Okay. That's what, what uh, temperance said. But after the civil war, temperance morphed into pro morphed, not morphed. They morphed into prohibition. And prohibition is just what the word says, prohibit. There were people who believed if you can outlaw alcohol, uh, and prohibition, by the way, is still going on. We're not trying to stamp out alcohol, but we've just got, fought a 50-year drug war against uh, a variety of drugs. Marijuana, that's about to be legalized again. And the question is, is each state going to get to legalize it, or is uh, the whole uh, the government, just the Congress, going to pass a law saying, like, like they did in 1937, they passed a law said, saying marijuana is illegal. Or are they going to pass a law that says marijuana is now legal? I think that's that's in the future. I've never used marijuana. Uh, I've been around, you know, in college parties and things where people were smoking marijuana. I'd just as soon go out and roll up some alfalfa. The way it smelled to me, uh, I'd just soon go out and roll up some alfalfa hay in the smoking papers and uh, smoke that. It sounded about as attractive, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. If I can make weed recreational, or whatever. That's legal. Yeah, but like beer is recreational. Yeah. You can go over here to the Seven Eleven today if you're 20. Is it 21 in Oklahoma? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what it was so. And if you're 21, and you can go over and uh, you know buy beer, it's a recreational drug. They're selling a recreational drug right over there. That's one place. I don't want to pick on them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what they're talking about. Uh, and I think it'll happen here. And over. It's, it's become, of course, now that we've made it, and I voted for it to make it uh, medically marijuana and legal, I voted for that. Um, not that I've ever used it, but, um, you know, I mean, I have to fess up. I use the most destructive, deadly drug in history. I drink scotch. That's, you know, and it's perfectly legal, and I can go buy a truckload of it if I want to. Believe it or not, I'm over 21. And I see, and I see people. You know, it's the same way. Forty-two years ago, when I was giving this lecture, and I see these little twits going. That old man, he, 
if we want beer, we'll get somebody. Well, so did we 50 years ago. I'm not saying it's impossible for you to get. I'm going to vote for to, to legalize marijuana. Not so, oh, Mr. Thompson's cool, you know, he wants us all in. No, no, no. If it's legal, it's harder for you to get. It's not impossible. It's like a beer is legal. You know, uh, how many how many bootleggers do you know? None. You know why? Because they made it legal, and the government took it over, and they taxed it. And again, it's not impossible for you to get. Nor was it me when I was 16 or 17 years old. It wasn't impossible. I'm not recommending that, but it wasn't impossible. But it was difficult. And until the front of your brain is done, and the front is wise and intelligent and cool as you think you are, the front of your brain isn't done. Ladies, you're close. Yours will mature quicker. When you're 21 or 25, if I see you and talk to you, it's like talking to you when you're 50. If I see one of them, when they're 25, you know, it's like, well, gee, you know, I thought I was going to a nice restaurant, but apparently I've walked into the duh club because your brain isn't going to be done, gentlemen, until you're about 30. As intelligent as you think you are, let me tell you something else, all of you, all, almost everything you believe right now, you're just dead certain about it. By the time you're 21, you're going to look back and say, I was an idiot. And by the time you're 40, you're going to look at the things you believed when you were 21 and you're going to say... <laughs> I was an idiot. And when you're 60, see, I've lived all these ages. When you're 60, I've got a little experience that you don't know. When you're 60, you're going to look at what you believed when you were 40, and you go, I was just a bleeding, blithering idiot. It is a wonder I'm still alive. That's going to happen. And 60. And I'm hoping 70. I'm knocking on the door. But I never felt better. Anyway. So if I felt any better, I couldn't stand it anyway. So, yeah, I know the path you're trotting, and I know just how, you know, you're just, you've got it all figured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just wait. <laughs> just wait. I think it's funny. Anyway, well, World War I came along, and the prohibitionists persuaded the government to pass. You've got the Volstead Act. Yeah. They said, hey, and, and here's the excuse they use. 1919? Yeah. Well, I think the Volstead Act is 1918. Anyway, so oh, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, well, anyway, it's during World War I. Yeah. And here's the excuse. They didn't come out and say, well, we're just, we're just trying to outlaw alcohol. What they said is, hey, everybody's trying to conserve food. Alcohol's made out of grain. So just for the war, let's just stop making alcohol. And then when the war's over, we'll start again. Uh, but when the war was over, you know, there were already 27 states that were officially dry. You couldn't buy booze there. In Arkansas, there's a couple of dry counties. In Texas, there are a couple of dry counties. But you can't sell any kind of alcohol. What does everybody do on Saturday night? They go over to the next county, buy it, and bring it back. Okay, but they didn't buy it there, so that county's officially dry. <coughs> so anyway, uh, the Volstead Act morphed into the 18th Amendment. And the 18th Amendment outlawed alcohol. That's the Prohibition Amendment. If you don't have that down, I think you do. But if you don't have that down, uh, you need to get it down. And, of course, Prohibition failed. Just like the drug war today, I regret to report, just like the drug war today, uh, you know, despite the best efforts of all of these authorities, it failed. We talked about the fact that Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. Dentists and doctors <coughs> carried cocaine Heroin wasn't illegal until 1984, 1984. Uh, in the 1920s, cocaine use was off the chart. One of the top 10 songs of the 1920s that the young lost generation were dancing to was Cocaine Habit. And here's the verse from Cocaine Habit. Uh, <coughs> I love my whiskey. <coughs> Pardon me. I love my whiskey. I love my gin, but the way I love my Coke is a dad gone sin. Now, that's what the young people of the 1920s, lest you think you're breaking new ground here. Well, we smoke marijuana. Well, people have been smoking marijuana for 10,000 years, okay? Uh, so you're not breaking any new ground here. I just want to make it harder for you to get. Anyway, until you're responsible, same way with alcohol. Is it easier for you to get a pack of cigarettes or is it easier for you to get marijuana? 
That's a no-brainer. Is it easier for you to get a pack of cigarettes or is it easier for you to get marijuana? But if you answer that question, that doesn't mean that you're a Marlboro smoking pothead. It just means you're, you've thought about it. Huh? Probably. Yeah, not probably weed. It's easier to get weed. You know why? You know who controls the back of the government does. Yeah. I worked in a liquor store when I was in college and some little snip like you look like you used to come sauntering in, you know, with their toughest walk. You know, and say, uh, give me a pint of Jack Daniels. And I said, I would say, give me about two minutes uh, till the police get here. Get out of here, you jackass. And they would go away, slink out. Like they were really fooling somebody. Oh, yeah. You know, and I could tell them, I could see them when they got out of their little car to come in and try and get that, give me a pint of Black Jack. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do with uh, marijuana. The government can take it over and tax it, build schools, and keep it out of your hands. Not make it impossible, right? You can still get it. If you're willing to deal with some pretty seedy people, you can still get it, but it'll be harder. And until you have a brain that's, ladies, completed, and that's going to be real quick, and until you other people have a brain that will someday be semi-completed, You'll be much more intelligent to make these these decisions. And then if marijuana is legal, it will be like if you decide to drink alcohol. And if you don't ever drink alcohol, you haven't missed a thing. But if you decide to drink it, you know, we put that up at 21, hopefully, hoping you've got a little bit more judgment than you do when you're 16. So that's what I want to do. Uh, anyway, um, well, of course, prohibition failed because people still wanted to drink. The drug wars fail because people still want drugs. Do you understand that we're the, this nation that you live in, we're the biggest drug consumers in the world? I just have to sit down and laugh when politicians get up and say, well, we've got to build a wall on the border because all those Mexican fentanyl dealers are coming through. You know what? I've never been driving home. Of course, you never know what's going to happen today, but I've never been driving home and seen some fair-haired American boy on his knees between two Mexican drug dealers, and they've got a gun to his head, and another one standing in front with a joint of marijuana saying, smoke that, oh, no, no, you know, smoke that, or, no. You know why we do drugs, you know why we have a drug problem in this country? It's not the fault of Mexico or anyone else. It's our fault. It's time to step up to the mirror and look at our mugs right in the, right in the mirror. We have a drug problem in this country because we want drugs. That's exactly right. And just like in Prohibition, we wanted alcohol. And guess what? Even though alcohol was illegal, just like fentanyl is illegal in this country today, there's always somebody there. Meth is illegal, but there's always somebody, if you want it, that will provide it for you. So you have bootleggers. We did speakeasies, didn't we? Yes. Look at that dirty, look at that dirty, grimy door there in some back alley. But if you knew the password and you got in, look at that. There are people in formal evening clothes. Uh, it's a nice bar. They had chandeliers. And look at that. You could get anything you wanted. Hot. Huh? I said hot. Yeah, hot. well, I look at that. Look at all those. That's right at the height of Prohibition. And there were 10,000 of those in Chicago. There were 30,000 of those in New York City. 30,000 illegal bars. That's how well Prohibition worked, which is to say it didn't work at all. And if you wanted to make your own, as I said yesterday, college boys made bathtub gin. Uh, but you had to know your drug dealer, just like today. You have to know your drug dealer because they might pass. If you don't, they might pass off something. They don't care. They don't care if they pass off something to you and you die a week later. Pff, they've got your money. It's no skin off their nose. There's always another person out there to buy what they're selling. You're dead. Okay, we'll get the next 350,000 people. And, of course, drinking became cool. Did you all ever figure out a uh, word for cool that this you Gen Zers use? Did you all ever figure that out? You're the first generation in history. Did somebody say something? Yet? Wait a minute. Well, yeah, somebody said something. Yet. I wrote it down. What was that? Pushing P. Pushing P. Where did I write that down? Well, I thought I wrote that down. Huh. I'll be. Let me see your pencil. I'm going to put that down. 
What was it in the twenty? I thought it didn't that bar this gonna be yesterday. You wrote a little baby down. Huh? Yeah. You did write a little baby down. Little baby, well, that's what I did. Little baby. Yeah, I was listening to him this morning. It's a him. Yeah. Little baby's a him. Yeah. I was listening to him this morning. <laughs> when I get a break at lunch, I'm gonna go on Amazon and order all of his music. You still don't order CDs, do you? Oh no, I don't think so. I don't think your car has a CD player. Oh really? Yeah, you know. No, it doesn't. Yeah, You know what it does have? Blue Cigarette lighter. That's it? It's amazing. A cigarette lighter. Uh, anyway, let's see. What am I writing? A little, no, it's not a little bit. Uh, Pushing P. Pushing P. Pushing? Yeah. That's I probably know. obscene, and you know this is being <laughs> taped. So if I'm called in front of the school board no, for, for oh, don't tell me that. If I'm called before the school, you laugh too hard. If I'm called before the school board because I'm corrupting the youth of McIntosh County, guess what? You're all coming with me, and if you don't show up, you're going to flunk this class. Did you hear that? Anyway, so push and pee. Well, what was it in the twenties? Cats, cats me out. Have you started saying that in the halls to get that started? No. Boy, you know that cap. You're, that, that's the cats me out. Gee, that car, that's the cat's meow. Did you hear that song? It's the cat's meow. I think that sounds better than pushing P, but anyway. Anyway, well, look, get this down. So that's a little review from yesterday, but get this down. It soon dawned on the criminal element, okay? When they made heroin illegal in 1984, the criminal element sitting out there going, hmm, if we start supplying people with it's legal, people still want it. And if we start supplying people with Heroin, guess what? We can get rich. So a group of people in the big cities, and we're, listen, get this down. We're going to use Chicago for an example because that's where the gang wars go on. I'm going to talk about, listen, write this down, the Chicago bootleg war. That's what it was called. If you were alive in the 20s, when you picked up your paper, there had been another gang land killing in, in, the, in the Chicago. Chicago was, listen, get this. I'll ask you this on the test on Friday. Chicago was the most violent city in America. And it may be today, right now. Uh, they're not fighting over booze and they're having gang warfare. Yeah. And it may be, I forget how many people are getting killed up there a day due to uh, gun violence. Uh, but look, if you listen, that listen, it's this simple. There are 10,000 speakeasies in Chicago and they all need booze. And if you can get control, if you and your gang can get control of supplying all those 10,000 speakeasies with booze once a week, and nobody else gets this. You can get very, very rich. And listen, get these gangs down. These gangs were ethnic gangs. There were Irish gangs, ethnic Irish. I want to talk about some of these guys. Irish gangs, uh, Jewish gangs, uh, Sicilian gangs. Italian gangs, and they were all headed by people, the mobsters. It's the mafia, okay? Yeah. And they're going to shoot it out in the streets of Chicago and other major, major cities, but especially Chicago and the Chicago bootleg wars. And get this down. There are three men who want to get control of the, Listen, are you with me? There are three men in the 1920s who want to get control of the booze trade in Chicago. They want to control it. And if they do, they can make millions and millions of dollars. One's an Irishman. Let's see, there he is. Write him down. They called him D.D. Dean O'Banion. Dean O'Banion. Dean O'Banion. Do what? I said he doesn't look like he'll bust a grape in a food fight. Yeah, you know what? You know what? You know, he's a mobster. But you know what? He, you know, to throw the authorities off. He ran a flower shop, and he hired his hoods to go kill people, and the police would come to him, and they'd say, D.D., we know it's you doing this. And he'd say, I'm a legitimate businessman. He had a chain of flower shops, and he would go to one every morning, walk in, break a carnation off, put it in his, put it in his lapel, give himself a boot here, and go back and start arranging flowers while his hoods were out murdering people, okay? He wants... He wants uh, to uh, control uh, and write this guy down, George. There's another Irishman, George Bugs Moran. Bugsy, his name was Bugsy. Uh, that was slang for this guy's crazy. You never know what he's going to do. He can be talking to you calmly one minute, and 30 seconds later, he beats you to death with a baseball bat. And he did beat him. Hey, D.D. O'Banion, 
You say he didn't look like he could what? You know what he did? You know what he did to his opponent? He, he found a couple of his guys who were running booze for him, you know, instead of bringing him, you know, he would give him a cut, but they were keeping his money. Uh, he, uh, uh, you know, had a cut, uh, three or four of his thugs, you know, he brought the guys in. Hey, how you been? Oh, yeah, how's the train? Oh, yeah, that's great. And then all of a sudden they grabbed him and they held him down one by one. And he walked, he walked around with a straight, you know what I'm talking about, a straight yeah. razor while they're laying on that table. And he slowly, you know, talking to him, took their shoes and socks off and he hooked that in at the heel of their feet. And they, he split the bottom of their feet open. And he didn't just do it once. He did it until their feet, both feet were just laying open like that. So yeah, I think he could have been capable of violence. Bugsy Moran, he's another Irishman. And there's the most famous criminal in America to this day. He was a Sicilian. And those three are going to shoot it out for the drug trade, or the uh, booze trade in Chicago. Who is that? Al, excellent. Write that down. Alphonse. They called him Al. Good for you. Alphonse Capone. He was called Scarface. He got started young. Scarface. Al. He got started young when he was 14 years old, and he was running numbers for bookies, and he had money on him in an alley in Chicago, and another bookies uh, guy ran a, and they got into a fight. And one of them slashed the side of his face with a razor. That's the kind of education he had. He wasn't in school learning about, I don't know, the 14 points. Uh, he got his face slashed. Uh, there's his mugshot, okay? Uh, Alphonse Capone. So those three guys want control of the uh, Chicago uh, booze trade. So get this down. Let's deal with DD first. DD. Like I say, was a florist by day. He always passed himself off. I'm a legitimate businessman. You know, why are you police picking on me? But by night, he was a criminal. And on the morning of November the 10th, you don't have to write that date down, but in 1920, just write 1924. On the morning of November, these are the Chicago bootleg wars now we're talking about. On November the 10th, 1924, he was, uh, he had come into his flower shop, put his boutonniere in, he'd gone to the back room, and he was arranging, he was cutting chrysanthemums. Is that how you pronounce that? Flower called the chrysanthemum. Well, anyway, flowers. Doesn't make any difference. And he heard a car pull up in front of his shop, and he turned and he looked. He could see the plate glass window through the door, and three men got out. And all three men had been part of his gang. In fact, I think one of them was presently a part. They'd all worked for him, but I think presently one was. And so he puts his flowers down and he walks around and he goes back and he's laughing, got his arms out. And they're laughing and they say, Dee Dee, how you doing? How you doing? Oh, great. And he reaches his hand to shake hands with the middle man and he does and he starts to pull his hand back. This is his right hand. He's got a gun right inside his coat. That's always helpful when you're making flower arrangements to take your pistol. And he starts to pull his hand back and the guy doesn't let it go and he knew he was dead. And he's trying to get his hand. And the other two guys pump something like 16 shells in it, and then turn around and walk out. He had a typical gangster funeral. There were 26 truckloads of flowers that followed his lead-lined coffin, lead-lined coffin to the cemetery. And the biggest wreath of all was on a truck sitting in the middle, and it said, rest in peace, Dee Dee, rest in peace, love, Al. Who had him killed? Capone. He bought his own gang. You see what he did? He bought his own gang out from under. Okay. So Capone gets rid of them. Now he's got to get rid of this guy. Right now. So what happened to George Bugsy Moran? Well, Capone moved against him. Got this down on February 14th. Now, do I, want, I do want you to write this date down. February 14th, 1929. You know, these, these criminals uh, had to... Uh, uh, keep their cars in top running condition because they were always out trying to outrun the police. And so uh, Moran's gang had two cars at a north side Chicago uh, mechanic shop. Uh, and so that morning, Moran and six of his men were going to drive down and pick up the cars and go on. And uh, they were in his office and it was a 
It's February. It's Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1929. In Chicago, it was a cold, pretty snowy day. And they were about to leave his office. And the thing that saved his life is that the phone rang. <coughs> and he stopped and picked up the phone. And these guys are waiting at the door. They're kind of, hey, boss. And he just goes, go on. I'll catch a cab and meet you down at the garage. So they all leave. Uh, and so Moran finishes conversation and these guys get in a car at six of them and they all go down to pick up these two cars. When they got to the garage at about 1030 in the morning, um, there was uh, an optometrist in there simply waiting for his car. There was a mechanic who worked at the garage and he was helping check. And I guess this optometrist car has been fixed and he was about to pay. And, uh, you know, Moran's men are just sort of standing around like, you know, when's it going to be our turn? And all of a sudden the door burst open. A, a police car, first of all, a police car pulled up in front of the mechanics garage at, uh, and uh, 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 four men got out. Two were dressed as civilians, detectives, right? And two were dressed in police uniforms. Uh, and uh, three of them were carrying uh, Thompson submachine guns. And they walk in and they said, you're under arrest. Everybody get against that wall. The mechanic said, hey, I just want to get against the wall. The optometrist said, hey, I'm just here to get my gut against the wall. And Moran's six men, they put against the wall in this north side Chicago garage. And uh, they're frisking them, you know. Uh, and uh, Moran's men, you know, they have their hands up and they're laughing and they're joking with each other. They said, ah, so what? We've been arrested a hundred times. They'll take us down to jail. We'll make one phone call to Bugsy. He'll come pay our bail and we'll be out on the street. And then the, and about this time, while they're frisking them against that wall, uh, Moran shows up in a cab and he looks and he sees that police car in front of the garage and he goes, ah, eh, I think I'm going to, I don't know what's going on, but I think I'm going to go across the street. So he goes across the street to drink a cup of coffee until the police car pulls away. And just about that time, these uh, policemen opened up and killed every one of those men, slaughtered them, shot them to death. Uh, who were those cops and detectives? They were Al Capone's men. They weren't cops and detectives. To show you the power of the gangs, had, they actually had a po real police car to carry out this shrine. <clears throat> There's Al. There's Al. There are the six men, and there they are, shot to death. Nobody ever went to jail for that. There they are. Write this down. That's the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Look at this. This guy, uh, one of them actually, when the real police get there, one of them was actually, actually alive. And uh, it was uh, Frank Gusenberg right there. You don't have to write him down, but Frank the Enforcer. When Moran had a really serious killing to do, he sent him and he never failed. Uh, but he was shot to pieces, but he was still alive. They rushed him to the hospital. And, of course, the police gathered around him. He's gasping at the doctor, so he doesn't have a chance, and he's gasping out his last breath. And the police know who did this. They know it's Al Capone. And they... Uh, they um, uh, lean down and they say, Frank, who shot you? And he would just look at them. Frank, can you talk? Who shot you? And he would just look at them. And finally they asked him one more time, Frank, who shot you? And his last words were, nobody shot me. And he died. And Capone got away. In other words, this guy, I guess thieves have a code <laughs> that they live by. This guy said, I ain't going to be a snitch to the very end. He, if he'd have just said Al Capone, if he'd have just said Al, they would have immediately shut down Capone, but he didn't. But there are the six dead men. Uh, Moran knew that, pardon the pun, he had literally dodged a bullet. He leaves. He goes to the West Coast and runs a gambling thing. I think he goes, Las Vegas was just starting in those days. He does that. But he actually runs afoul of the law. He gets arrested. He died in jail. He died without a penny. Uh, but a guy, I guess at least he had his life, uh, his life for a while. Uh, look, get this down. So, so when now um, 
Now, um, Moran is out of the way. Uh, and Capone, there's Frank Gusenberg. There he is. Capone, get this now. He becomes the king of Chicago. He ran Chicago like his own personal little kingdom. There's a, there's a suburb of Chicago also named Cicero that he worked in. And one time the mayor made a statement, said something. And by the way, the mayor was on Capone's payroll. He was he did anything, but he, he made some sort of statement that could be construed as being critical. And Capone had his men take him down to the mayor's office. Uh, and uh, he went upstairs. It was a couple of flights of stairs. He goes upstairs. He drags the mayor out and kicked him down the stairs and then walked off kind of like this. Don't say that anymore. On one occasion, he found to out that two of his men were not turning in all the money. They were keeping the money. And so he threw them a banquet, I think, on one of their birthdays. And everybody was there with their wives and sweethearts. And they were all in tuxedos and evening gowns. And Al Capone was sitting at the head table, and one of these guys was on one side. And I'm sure they were gee, I wonder why Al's doing this for us. And he got up, and he makes a little speech. He said, these are two of the most trusted men in my organization. We couldn't operate without them. Everybody applauded, and he stepped back, and at that moment, two of his uh, goons came out uh, with baseball bats, and they hit those guys in the back of the head, and they fell forward on the table. And in front of a horrified crowd of probably 250 people, they beat them to death. Literally, that's a, we say that, oh, I'm going to beat, they literally beat them to death with baseball bats, while Capone stood back in the tuxedo and their blood was splattering on him. He made sure the job was done. That's the way he ran his organization. By the time he's done, he's making a hundred million dollars a year. Get this down. He's running Chicago. He's making a hundred. That would be a billion dollars a year, at least and maybe more in today's money. He's making a hundred million dollars in gambling, in rackets. You know what the rackets are? You ever heard of that? The you know what the rackets are? You're, what are they? Uh, gambling. Well, the, 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 yeah, but the rack, the quote, the rackets are: if you run a, if you were a guy running a little, you and your wife were running a dry cleaning store, two people would show up and they would say, "Hey, you know these are dangerous times. How would you like protection?" Well, you know, we've been here thirty years, and uh, you know we haven't needed any protection so far. Thank you very much. And the next week, your your uh, shop burned down to the ground. Uh, and all the businesses around that said, hey, maybe we need protection. And so once a month, people working for Capone would come and they would get money from you. That generated millions of dollars for Al Capone. Illegal gambling, prostitution, drugs. I'm talking about drugs beside alcohol, and his main thing is alcohol. When he went to the movie theater, they would rent the whole movie theater. Nobody else could sit there. And he would uh, go down, uh, he would go in a, Bulletproof car, lead in the doors. Uh, let me see. I think I've got it here. Um, a seven-ton bulletproof car. Uh, there were there was a carload of bodyguards in front of him and behind him. And we went to the movie theater. He sat right in the middle of the th movie theater with twenty armed guards around him. Okay, twenty armed guards around him. The Chicago police got this down. They they came up with a special unit. They said, we want to catch this guy and write this man down, Elliot Nest. He headed a group of special cops, and their only job, they weren't out doing traffic tickets, their only job, catch Al Capone, catch him. And they were called the untouchables. Why were they called the untouchables? They couldn't be run by them. Excellent, excellent. Did you hear what he said? They wouldn't take bribes. One of the ways that Al Capone got away with everything he got away with is he paid off the judges. He paid off the police force. There were people on the police force taking money from Capone. Uh, <coughs> these guys didn't take bribes. They were honest cops. Did they catch Capone? No. They tried for years. They never got him. Who finally got Capone and put him in prison? This is interesting. We're doing this in April. An IRS agent. You know what the IRS is? If you don't, you will. It's called the Internal Revenue Service. Right? They collect taxes for the U.S. government. And there was a little... Here the police had done everything they could to catch the phone. 
Capone was just, pardon the pun, bulletproof. And this guy's looking through the records. And guess what he discovered? All that billion, today it would be that all those billions of dollars that Capone made, he had never done what, Mr. Watkins? Taxes. Pay his taxes. So you know what they find? He beat people to death with baseball bats. He slaughtered people. He mass You know what they finally got him for? Not paying his taxes. It's a crime. It's called income tax evade, evade not invasion, evasion. You don't pay your taxes and you can, you can go to jail. I just paid my taxes, I assure you. It was a thrill a minute. Uh, but they're really fun. Uh, but, of course, you know, we live in the, this great this great and free republic, it didn't happen by accident. That's one little contribution we can make. That's the way I view paying taxes. I don't like paying taxes, but that's the way I view it. Anyway, so they sent, uh, so, so Al Capone is found guilty and they sent him to prison. In fact, they sent him right out there to the, it, it had just opened in the 1920s and it had opened to put these gang people in when they captured them. It's the most famous prison in America. It's no longer a prison. It sits out in San Francisco Bay. It's a museum today. Uh, I went to San Francisco and stood on the fisherman, Fisherman's Wharf, and I looked out and saw it. I should have got on the boat, I guess, but I just didn't feel like doing it, so I didn't. What is the name of that prison? What? Who said something? Alcatraz. Alcatraz, yes. Okay. Write that down. What was the other one? What was the other one? Okay, so we have a game, like on PlayStation, you know, mm -hmm. and it has that on there. What well, was it? All this stuff. Little baby. Little baby. Little baby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it has like a key line. This game on your, what is it? Like a, our PlayStation. What is it? It's a, called Warzone. Warzone. Well. And it has like, you fight other people online on there. Well, some of the most fun, you know, and people go out there when they say, when they go out there and they want to, they, they tour the places, but everybody wants to see Al Capone's cell and it's perfectly preserved, just like it was when old Al sat there. And he was there. And by the way, they, nobody you know, ever escaped from Alcatraz. You can stand there and you can see San Francisco. Well, there's the Golden Gate Bridge right behind it. You can see that. But the water's very cold. They said if you swam the several miles it would take to get to uh, Alcatraz, you would die of hypothermia. Uh, plus there are sharks out there. They might get you as well. So it had a perfect record once they put you, they called it the rock. Once they put you on the rock, you never, uh, you never went anywhere else. Uh, Hal Capone served seven years and they released him and then he went down to Miami, Florida. That's one of the last pictures taken of him. He's out, in the, he slept late that morning. He's still in his bathrobe and his pajamas and slippers. He's got a cigar and he had a yacht and he's fishing off the back of his yacht. And he died of, in 1947, two years after World War II, um, of a combination of heart disease, syphilis, and a stroke, okay? Well, by 1933, get this down, by 1933 then, the government realized, the government realized that prohibition had failed. But people who favored prohibition still said, yes, it might have failed. Get this down. But it was a noble experiment. Write that down. If you ever see those words always associated with um, prohibition, it was a noble experiment. In other words, we tried, we failed, but we tried to do a very good thing, a very good thing. Uh, but they didn't stop drugs. And finally, the 21st Amendment Get this down in 1933, the 21st Amendment replaced the 18th Amendment, and booze became legal again. Well, get this down. This is what I'll talk to you about tomorrow, the legacy. So in other words, what difference? It didn't stop drugs, but what difference did prohibition make? So when I come in tomorrow. I need to see Preston Dalton, Valerie Lewis, and Caden Dunbar in the library. When I come in tomorrow and say, where did we stop? When I come in tomorrow and say, where did we stop? Say the legacy of prohibition. And study for this essay exam. Be sure you do. That's next week, right? I'm just giving you advance warning.
Study for this exam. First things first, study for this exam. You need to listen, hold it. You need to study about 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day for if, if you would go to listen, just hold. If you'd go to advisory today and you've all got advisory and for 15 minutes of advisory, you'd look over just what we did today. And you would do that every day to a part of your notes. You would amaze yourself on how well you would do on this test.